the subject of my talk tonight is about something that is smarter than you are, artificial intelligence. In fact, a lot of people who work in artificial intelligence believe that artificial intelligence is a thousand times smarter than we are. It will be moving at speeds that are a hundred thousand times as fast as we think, and it will be digesting information and data a million times more than we can. What is artificial intelligence? There are a lot of confused ideas about this outside in the world. But the answer is very simple. It's one sentence. Artificial intelligence is software that writes itself. It writes its own updates. It renews itself. We normally tend to think of software as stuff that we created and that we wrote and the machines do what we tell them to do and we own it. This is not any longer true. It writes itself at speeds that we can hardly comprehend and people who write it know that you can't take it apart again and figure out what it's done. It writes independently, autonomously. It develops its own way of thinking and there are dangers associated with that. So a lot of people ask, when is it going to happen? When is artificial intelligence going to be smarter than us people? Some people say 50 years. Some say 30 years. Some say five years. I say it already has surpassed us in many areas of our society. Let's take, for example, some, uh, some examples from right here and now. And uh, I apparently have to point this. Goes. OK. The examples that we're going to talk about are not science fiction. They're not visions. They aren't things that are going to happen at some point. They are things that exist today, for example, in the stock markets, whether Frankfurt or Tokyo or New York or London. The people you see down there working on your TV show and you're watching it, they're more or less extras in a movie. They aren't doing the big moving. The big moving is being done by high-frequency computers. They move so fast, they make, in milliseconds, billion-dollar business. Computers have far su succeeded what we can do. In fact, I did a film once about a company that moved five blocks closer to the Frankfurt stock market because at the speed of light on glass cable, they saved so much time getting closer to the computers at the, at the Frankfurter Stock Exchange. That will give you an idea of how fast they they think and how helpless we as human beings are. You may remember the old pictures of the stockbrokers with five telephones in each hand, running back and forth, writing things on paper. That was way before yesterday. Computers have taken over this very, very important part of our society, a heart of our financial community. And no one understands exactly how these algorithms function. They used to understand them, but they've been improved by artificial intelligence. I don't know how many people flew in today, but if you were sitting in an airplane, you probably have 30 different tar tariffs and prices in your cabin because the pricing is all done, same is true of hotels, by machines that are collecting global information, making decisions within split seconds what the price of that airplane seat or that hotel room is going to be. And where it's most critical of all, we're, we're talking about life and death, is in medicine. Computers are better than we are as human beings in several areas already today. We're talking about here and now. This is not science fiction. I'm speaking next week at the uh, Universitätsklinikum in Essen. And their radiologists, who are supposed to be some of the best radiologists in Germany, they say that a computer can recognize a tumor on an MT or a CT, MRT or CT, faster and better and more precisely than a human being can. It's picture analysis, and it's done very well by computers, especially in medicine, where it saves lives. Now, the, the robots are getting better and better. They're looking cute. They have these big baby eyes, the sweet way of looking at you. They can examine your facial expression and adjust theirs. But don't be fooled by robots, even when they get warm skin and even when they get perfume and they start smelling like us and getting really interesting. They are still machines. They have no warm blood in them, there's no sex in them, they have no mortality. They're cold code lines, and they shouldn't be misunderstood. Now, I want you to understand what the power of 
artificial intelligence is. And I have two examples. One is surveillance cameras. Everybody knows, you know, that we're being watched by cameras everywhere. And most people think surveillance is a camera there and it's me down here and it's watching me. One person, one camera. Well, that's because we're stupid. That's the way we comprehend the surveillance. One camera, one person. We can't comprehend it when it goes beyond that. This image was taken 17,500 feet above Quantico, Virginia, and covers 15 square miles. This whole image is at a very, very fine resolution. So if we wanted to know what is going on in any spot along this image, say near this building at this intersection, everything that is a moving object is being automatically tracked. The color boxes represent that the computer has recognized the moving objects. You can see individuals crossing the street. You can see individuals walking in parking lots. There's actually enough resolution to be able to see the people waving their arms or walking around, what kind of clothes they wear. Unlike the Predator camera that limits field of view, Argus melds together video from each of its 368 chips to create a 1.8 billion pixel video stream. This makes it possible to zoom in and still see tremendous detail. And a million produces a million terabytes every day. That's a lot of data. And I'm telling you this because not that the sensors are modern and not that the photography is modern. Behind that is a brain or a cognitive intelligence. And that brain is in a position to analyze everybody down there. At the same time, in real time, they see where everyone is going. We can understand it when we reduce it to a single person, but we cannot understand it when you're talking about a hundred thousand people in the city, plus the vehicles, which you all recognize. Due to such systems, they have also redone facial recognition. You probably think facial recognition is, is from the front. But uh, they've redone to do it from the top, because that's where the drones are. And they look at your ears, they look at the way you walk, they look at your head. That's modern facial recognition. So that's one idea. As a human being, we think of a, one camera and one person. <coughs> This is, a, this is a little of their things. That it's, it's taking all the details, all the music up, to, and they record it so they can tell where that person was two weeks ago, two months ago, what stores he visited, what his whole behavioral patterns are. That's all part of the analysis of Argo, Argus. These are called uh, tennis balls in military and intelligence circles. It's a new secret of sensoric thing, a, a cruise missile will fly into a valley in Afghanistan, and this is especially important because the troops have left many of these areas, <coughs> and it will drop literally thousands of these sensor packages, or these tennis balls. They're all packed in foam rubber. They record with cameras, they record with microphones, they record with seismic measurements, they record with Geiger counters, they record with chemical sensors that can look for the chemical things, that's not the amazing part of it, and it's not the amazing part that they have a little signal that goes over here to the transmitter, the transmitter goes up to the satellite. Old technology, nothing special. But the special part of it is, behind that system, there's a fusion software that can combine the audio and the visual and the seismic and the chemical, all of these signals, and make sense of them and analyze on the ground what kind of troop movements they are, what are the kinds of vehicles they're using? What are they transporting? Is there radioactivity in that? It takes all of these different pieces of information and turns it through fusion software into an understandable picture, which goes way beyond, way beyond our, our vision. Artificial intelligence only works if you have huge data masses. Artificial intelligence only works if you have big data. But big data only works if you have artificial intelligence to make sense of it, because human beings can no longer sort and sift and order the huge volumes of data that we have collected. And thus, it is not surprising that the company that has the most information in the world is probably the most powerful country in the world, Google, 
is very interested in artificial intelligence and has been traveling around the world as a shopping queen, buying all the companies that are dealing with robotics. This is one of their robots. This is called Atlas. And they're buying artificial intelligence, all the artificial intelligence companies from around the world. Now this is, if you ask Google, it's a peaceful robot, right? He doesn't have a gun. He doesn't throw atomic bombs. You know, he just walks around and stands there. But you may have seen the uh, superimposers DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. That is the uh, research arm of the Pentagon. And then you see the video was made by Lockheed Martin, which is one of the most powerful and influential and richest weapons companies in the world. So why is the Pentagon investing this money? Why has Lockheed Martin uh, taken over large aspects of the company? This guy's called Big Dog. He also belongs to Google, also DARPA financed. Peaceful dog, right? Unless he gets caught on a maneuver of the United States Marines as part of a military unit. So these are not flower children. These are robots that have a function, and robots that have a function and an intelligence, and perhaps an intelligence that goes beyond us, are dangerous things. Now that's a, a Predator drone. It was taken as a secret of United States Air Force Base in New Mexico. Predator drones you've seen, right? You've seen them on TV, you've seen them in the newspapers. They're old. They're 20 years old, the technology. This is, I mean, it looks very scary when the Spiegel and the ARD write uh, modern technology and the guys in the joystick and killing people and, tele and Taliban and in Afghanistan far away. But that's what a modern drone looks like. This is not a Predator, this is a Pegasus. It's an X-47B, it's owned by the Navy. It's a jet-powered machine, not like a propeller-driven Predator. It goes 2,000 miles into enemy territory. It carries 2,000 kilos worth of explosives and is run by artificial intelligence. It starts alone, flies its mission alone, comes back alone, and here's the clue, it lands all by itself on an aircraft carrier. Talk to any pilot you've ever met. What's the most difficult landing area you can possibly imagine? They say it's an aircraft carrier. Short runway, things moving, very hard. This thinking drone can do it, but here are the two keys. To Pegasus. Pegasus is invisible. Now I'm not talking about stealth and being in invisible to radar, I'm talking about invisible to the human eye. And you won't find this in any newspaper anywhere. It's invisible to the human eye because the bottom has an LED uh, layer on it and the top has cameras w which have been removed here in the picture which film the sky and they project at the bottom a live picture of the clouds up above the aircraft and you can hardly see it. And they're responsible for a lot of these uh, UFO sightings in, in Nevada near the testing areas. Jet engine propulsion, a reach of, oops, this is in German, of 2,000 miles, starting landing all by itself. Stealth is optical stealth, you can't see it. And the kill decision, which is required by United States law to be made by human beings. Human beings must be in the, in the loop before someone is killed by a drone but it's in the machine, and it doesn't need people. It can decide by itself whether or not it kills somebody. And the experts say it's gonna make less mistakes and less collateral damage than the human decisions. The kill decision in robots in the air, in robots on the ground, in robots in the water or underwater, where there are also drones, is made by, or can be made by machines. And in my book, I quote many official United States government documents which say, our goal is to have the kill decision made by them. And the problem is, artificial intelligence, sometimes they make mistakes. This is Talon, he's an automatic cannon. <laughs> I mean, they can, a lot of ammunition in that thing, and you can also put rockets on it. And it's in Iraq since 2007. At a demonstration, with U.S. generals and experts. The damn thing got out of control and started pointing at the audience. And there was a Marine there, thank goodness, running across the field who tackled it like a football player and threw it on his side and probably prevented a couple hundred people from being killed. 
Now, this wasn't reason enough to take a lucrative contract away from the company that built it, and it wasn't enough to take the town out of Iraq. It's just sort of off-duty for the moment, because you know, it, uh, there, there were some early stages of development, you know, that, that kind of problem. But don't underestimate artificial intelligence, because it's getting better every day, and it's going to scare us. You know, I'm right at the right time where I say stop because I want to take a look now. This has all been here and now technology. Let's go to the future. Not far, just a little bit to the internet of things, to artificial intelligence as being spread out. It's not a central machine in a box where you can pull the plug. Artificial intelligence is networked, like the internet of things. And part of it may be in a smart watch or a refrigerator or in a supercomputer. And the intelligence exists only by networking it together. If the supercomputer needs more computer power, it goes there and gets it out of the internet. If the computer needs better programs, it goes there and gets those programs. And if it needs more information, more data, it goes there and gets more data. It sets up a spontaneous network for its needs, which collapses when it no longer needs it. It does this, it does this without us. And you have to imagine, like, these are, there are these intelligence nodes all over the place. And they're like drops of mercury on a glass table. They will find their way to each other. They will find their way together. Now, we have to be very careful because survival is an issue for artificial intelligence. It needs to exist to be able to do the things it wants to do according to its program. So it lays like in insect eggs backups and computer programs all over the world, thousands and thousands of them, so that if we do destroy part of it, it's still alive. My job to you is the wake-up call to make you aware of the problem. Your job is to figure out how we're going to stop this before it kills us. <laughs>